Good evening, everybody. This is the fourth in our four part session on kindness, clarity, and insight as an introduction to Buddhist practices. Um, uh, as I think I mentioned last week, what I'm going to, um, we're, we're on, we're exclusively on um, training and wisdom tonight. And in previous uh, times uh, here, uh, I talked a lot uh, in pretty deep, as deep detail as I could about um, the philosophy of emptiness as understood in the Tsongkhapa's lineage, um, as, as I tried to explain it in as much depth and detail as, as I could, as I've figured it out myself. Um, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not intending to do that um, tonight. <laughs> um, but instead, I thought what I had to do something different. We just look at some examples from um, different kinds of Buddhist meditative practices that have led to people having transformative experiences. And just look at these, you know, next to each other and see what kinds of things, what those experiences are like and, and what kinds of practices are, are leading to them. Okay, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the plan. Oh, uh, Sunny, you have to make me a host, please. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yep. Okay. Doke. Okay. Major comments. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's just start out with. Uh, this short verse, I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, May I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. <clears throat> okay, so tonight, as I said, we're doing the training in wisdom. We have training in ethics training in uh, yeah, meditative practices of concentration and then using uh, the calmness that you brought into your life and into your mind through those two trainings to engage in an inquiry into the actual uh, nature of things. And that's the training in wisdom. So as I've talked about before, my way of summing up the basic idea of the idea of Buddhism, which is not the whole of Buddhism, but the basic idea is that we suffer needlessly because we don't see things as they are. So in order to, we can liberate ourselves from needless suffering by coming to see things more realistically. And in order to do that, we do some kind of practice, because as I said, we're looking at Buddhism as a collection of practices, types of trainings. Um, we have to systematically through some some uh, type of practice, systematically inquire, investigate, examine, scrutinize um, how it is that things exist, how, it, how things are, or you could even say what exactly things are, uh, both in practical terms and fundamentally what their fundamental nature is. So yeah, the w wisdom includes, um, yeah, understanding all kinds of uh, practical things, how the world actually works. But uh, the liberating wisdom that's distinct to Buddhism is this idea of uh, a wisdom that is an insight into the fundamental nature of things, right? That we're not seeing them as they are. Um, so here's a little, um, I, <clears throat> I'm a fan of a book called Zen Master Raven by uh, Robert Aitken Roshi, the late Robert Aitken Roshi. And this is a little in which the uh, Roshi 
is um, a raven and the students are other animals in the forest. So relaxing with the others, uh, after Zazam one evening, Owl asked, what is the spirit of practice? And Raven said, inquiry. Owl cocked his head and asked, what do I inquire about? And Raven said, good start. Okay, so like Aitken had a, a sense of humor. Um, and by good start, he means that's not the end. <laughs> we have to go deeper. And um, uh, I think it was a Boundless Way Zen Center somewhere in upstate New York. Somebody posted this uh, on their website uh, as a treating it as a koan and giving a sort of Zen verse in response to it. And in their verse, they said, the better question isn't why, it's what. What is this right here and now, this sensation, this emotion, this world presenting itself before me? This, what is this? Curiosity is the path and it leads not to knowledge, but to intimacy. So that way of expressing it that um, is, um, yeah, as a Zen flavor, which I, I like this use of the word intimacy in Zen um, because I think it makes a connection between the idea of kindness or compassion on the one hand and the insight into the non-duality of things from the wisdom side. Yeah. So we went over this uh, last time that when you investigate how it is that we're seeing things incorrectly, when you inquire into it, um, you can see that uh, things are impermanent. They're evanescent, right? They quickly pass away. Um, they also have a expiration date. <laughs> so they're changing all the time. And then there's a point at which they change so dramatically uh, that they're not recognizable. Subtle impermanence, you know, this changing all the time thing. In Tibetan, uh, it's talked about as ge chikma, and uh, in Sanskrit, it's kshanika, uh, which means momentariness, like moment by moment, instant by instant, everything's changing, right? Um, but when you start thinking about like instant by instant, how long are these instants, right? And you'll find, you know, various sources that <laughs> in our early Buddhist tradition will say, oh, well, an instant is like one 360th of the time it takes you to snap your fingers or something like that. And so really probably what an instant was, was uh, akshana, akshana, a moment, was the smallest um, moment of this smallest duration of experience that a really, really good meditator could notice, right? So it would definitely be uh, less than a second, right? How many, how many, what fraction of a second exactly, right? You can, you can, this is an empirical question, right? But you could actually investigate in the laboratory and see what's the briefest thing that people can notice. This is a known thing, right? I just don't know it at this moment. But so there's these moments and they're very, very, very brief and one succeeds another so fast that we don't even notice this succession. Um, but when you think about it, like each of these subtle moments has its own duration. <laughs> each of these subtle moments has its own beginning, middle, and an end. And so really momentariness is a way of talking about the fact that things are, are flowing. Um, you can't um, pin down a, a moment as an irreducible moment of experience or of time um, because even it has a beginning, middle, and an end. Uh, even it's, you know, depends upon parts. So, <clears throat> um, and then dependent arising, emptiness of independent existence, emptiness and dependent arising, having, being two sides of the same coin, so to speak, um, that nothing exists independently and in nothing exists in and of itself, right? Things exist only through interdependent relationships which doesn't, isn't exactly the same thing as saying everything's connected because um, when a lot of people talk about how everything, when people, sometimes when people, we think, when we think about dependent rising or everything being connected in some way, 
we're thinking about these things being there and then having relationships. But the point of dependent arising is that things uh, aren't there in order to form relationships with other things. They're, they're there only because of relationships with other things. And then do you say, and then in turn can be the basis for connecting with other things. But it's, it's uh, the interconnectedness that's behind what we call a thing or inside and, or before what we call a thing, right? That we can't take for granted and just think that there's things there and now we're gonna find the connections between them. <clears throat> We'll look at that more before the end of tonight. So uh, you, three classical Buddhist philosophy ways of talking about dependent arising is that effects depend on causes or conditions. Um, holes or part possessors depend on parts. And the subtlest and the most difficult to understand is that everything depends on mental imputation. It depends on a perspective. It depends on a point of view relative to which it's appropriate to regard something as a table or a hat and so forth. Um, and, you know, if I'm, you know, sober and so forth, and I can see that this is a table in front of me, but there are other beings who uh, ha have their sense faculties um, based on their past karma and so forth, um, constituted differently um, from whose perspective it's not a table. There isn't a table. That doesn't, that's not a thing in their world, right? So, um, right, we have, if, if the world were just a bunch of objectively existing objects, which we can either see accurately or not, right, it wouldn't make any sense to say that there's a table here and not a table here at the same time, depending on who's looking. But the world, that's, one, that's the way actually the world is. Um, things aren't uh, constituted through objective conglomerations of atoms. Then we can say that they're atoms and they're molecules and so forth. But exactly, you know, to talk about an atom or talk about a molecule or talk about a table requires a certain perspective or point of view relative to which that, that, that it, it makes sense to designate or regard that thing in that way, right? Think about a you know, a bird flying over Brooklyn, right? And they're, they're there in Brooklyn, but are they? <laughs> they're not in the Brooklyn, you know, their whole, their whole world of what they sense and experience there is like uh, overlaps with ours, but is like very, very different. And that's what we mean by mental imputation. Um, when we look, I, when I teach this in my class, I say, I, I draw, the letter A up on the blackboard. And then I go out and sit in the classroom with the students and I say, oh yeah, you know, we're just past chilling back here. And the professor, the message of important message the professor wrote on the board is like radiating itself down here. I mean, we're not doing anything. But then of course, if you stop and think for a second, that's obviously wrong. And that, you know, there's some chalk marks or, or ma magic marker marks up there on the board. And we have learned when we see these in a certain pattern um, to designate that as a, the letter A, right? And so we're all, we're all participating and constituting that as an A and we're doing it correctly, right? But we're, it's, not, it's not anything except in, the, in terms of its relationship to us. Okay, so that's the tougher one to, for people to get used to. It's the subtlest and deepest meaning of dependent arising in, in this tradition. So uh, a couple of quotes that I, from Buddha Gosa about this, within a stream, of, with a stream of continuity, as I was talking about, everything's flowing. There's neither identity there's, or otherness. It's not, you can't pin things down as being the same or pin them down as being different. Because if they were, if there were, they had a nature of being the same, then there wouldn't be any curd that formed from the milk. Um, but uh, if there were, if the curd were something really other than the milk, then it couldn't be derived from milk. You wouldn't find it there in the same glass where you had left the milk the night before. So yeah, it's like that with everything, obviously. And only a few things like rivers and, and, and flames make it completely obvious. 
But it's like that with everything. And, you know, the example that's actually that Buddha Ghost is messing with here is actually in um, the Pali Canon, the Buddha's scripture that Buddha, Buddha uses this example of milk left out overnight. So neither exact oneness nor, or absolute otherness can be assumed, but that's where we, we our mind, we try to, we kind of go to both places at, at the same time and contradict ourselves, right? And say, you know, um, am I the same person I was yesterday? Yes. <laughs> am I the same person I was last year? Well, am I the same person I was 50 years ago? No. Am I the same person I was yesterday? Yes. When did, when did it change from yeah, no to yes? And you can just go in the middle and find a place where you get really uncomfortable because you can't really say for sure whether you were in some sense it's the same or not, right? Yeah. The problem is that the question assumes that there's some sort of essential nature to things that can either be the same or different when in fact the nature of things is to flow. So if you assume that there's something that's not flowing, right, then you'll have to either think that that stable thing has an endpoint and is annihilated or that it doesn't. And if, if you think that it's annihilated, right? Um, if you think that it's never annihilated, then you're uh, an eternalist, right? You know, I, I, I haven't changed because the real me is my eternal soul, um, right? And on the other hand, if you think um, that it does come to be annihilated, right? Then you fall into nihilism that, you know, we, we we're, we do exist now for sure, but then we will absolutely not exist at a certain point. So assuming that there's a stable being, a sort of unchanging, non-flowing, real thing, it, it wipes, it, it, it contradicts the way the world as we actually observe it. If we're inquiring, if we're paying attention, right? And yeah investigating even slightly how things work in the world. And it's the same with, that's with, you know, cause and effect, but it's the same with parts and wholes. You know, when parts are arranged like in a certain way, then we designate something, this thing is a car and that thing is a house and this as a fist and so forth. But in the ultimate sense, when you examine each of the parts, um, <clears throat> There are these things like an army, you can't, you know, pin down exactly where the army is. Of course, I teach on the university campus and I always like get them to try to think about where the university is. Can they point to the university? Where, who or what or where in, in, is the university? It used to be that people thought the university was a physical place located in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. But then the university sort of started having campuses all over the United States and, and identifying itself in terms of its website, at least as much as its geographical location. And, you know, it became even harder to say what or where the university was. So Buddha goes so talking based on, on Pali Canon says, it's the same thing with our mind and body. It's uh, practical and useful and appropriate to say there's a person here, right? But it's not because we can look inside the, the flux of my mental sensations, right? Or the organs or molecules or cells of my body and find that person, right? When each component's examined, there isn't any being that's the basis for this assumption, I am or I, right? And if you see things this way, Right? It doesn't mean that you deny the existence of beings or persons. It's just that you start to understand um, persons as they are instead of, you know, instead of the incoherent way that we usually think of ourselves as somehow being the same and yet changing at the same time. Um, <clears throat> so, um, as I th said, uh, most of this evening, I wanted to look at some experiences that people had through different practices of inquiry. And um, I, I got quite a few together. I mean, I, I had never really done this before. Um, 
obviously one could create quite a large collection of such things. But I, I just sort of roughly categorize them into three kinds of practices, uh, meditative analysis, um, mindfulness meditation, and um, Zen koan practice. Um, so there's obviously other types um, of Buddhist practices that um, are practices of insight uh, that lead to uh, insight, powerful insight, wisdom experiences that are transformative in these people's lives, right? So this isn't a, a comprehensive list, but it, it, I'm just, you know, picking these three and, um, and then give some examples. Um, so uh, we're gonna look at uh, the Dalai Lama's own experience and also that of Geshe Rapten. And then in terms of mindfulness-based inquiry, um, we'll have a passage from the Pali Canon called uh, the Bajira Sutta. Um, and then also a story about a contemporary um, late 20th century uh, Thai uh, nun and her experience. Um, along with that, we'll also look briefly at the actual scripture that's the basis for mindfulness practice. And then um, there's quite a lot of Chan Zen stories um, also we'll look at a few of those, um, a brief passage from Han Shan, the great, uh, Chinese Buddhist poet, um, and, uh, Satomi Myoto, who started out as a Shinto shaman, and then later became a student of Yasutani Roshi and experienced Kensho, uh, Soko Morinaga, who was a, um, Rinzai, um, a Rinzai, Roshi um, and Thich Nhat Hanh, of course, a little, little a poem of his. It, I don't know if it, it's not, it, it expresses his wisdom understanding, I guess we could say that. So let's, um, yeah, look first at the Dalai Lama's experience. I don't know if you've read this before. This passage comes from the book, uh, How to See Yourself as You Really Are. Um, well, yeah, which is a sort of guidebook to how to meditate on emptiness or how to do this inquiry, how to investigate who it is that you really are. And in the course of giving all these instructions for different types of, uh, you know, analytical meditations and preparations for analytical meditations and things to be aware of, he talks about his own experience in a, in a very direct way. Um, and he says this, it was sudden, sudden, suddenly it was though lightning moved through my chest and I was so awestruck, awestruck that over the next few weeks, whenever I saw people, they seemed like a magician's illusion, magician's illusions, and that they appeared to exist right there inherently. But I knew that they actually did not. This is when I began to understand that it is truly possible to stop the process of creating destructive emotions by no longer assenting just going along with the way that the I and other phenomena appear to exist. So this is like, yeah, way in, you know, he talks about the experience part, but then it's like what kind of insight he takes away from that experience, right? Is it's really true that there's a delusion um, about how things exist and things appear in line with the digital delusion. They look, stable. They look uh, like they're set up from their own side. Uh, you know, when I, when I walk into the room and see the table, it doesn't disclose to me <laughs> how it's, it merely ex it exists as a conventional designation. It appears to just be there in and of itself on its own. And it doesn't look, appear to be unlike the river or the um, flame. It doesn't appear to be changing at all. Right, so there's this deceptive appearance, and um, and we just assent to that. We just go along with that and treat things uh, as though they existed, just as they appear. And so, if you recognize that things don't really exist as they appear, if you start to undermine that illusion or or delusion, right, then you can become liberated from greed and hatred and jealousy and envy because 
these kinds of destructive emotions are nurtured by and grow, you know, in the in the petri dish of uh, this delusion. This is what it means to say we suffer needlessly because we don't see things as they are. <clears throat> you can think of there are lots of examples, right? But um, I always like to use the example um, with my students because <clears throat> undergraduate students really uh, subsist on pizza, right? And they seem to all like pizza and you can get them to come to events um, outside class time if you are offering free pizza. So um, uh, yeah, and also right now there's a lot of food insecurity on campus and some of the students are actually hungry. So um, you can conjure up a situation where you're hungry and you're waiting for the pizza to be delivered and it's coming a little bit late and then finally it arrives and you can smell it and then you open the box. And okay, so the pizza as it appears to your mind at that time is uh, appears like not just um, digestible or nutritious, <laughs> it appears uh, it appears to be objectively from its own side, kind of have an adherent deliciousness to it, right? It's, see, it, it's attractiveness to our minds is, is, is um, impregnated, I want, I'm going to say. It's like it's coming, its attractiveness is coming from its inner nature. It's coming from, it's not coming from our mind. Its attractiveness is like Right, and you see, and, and so I talk about this because it's easier than having a conversation about sexual attraction in a direct way, but it's like, right, and it's easy to go from that to say, oh yeah, when you're, when you're strongly um, sexually attracted to somebody, you, you invest them as having from their own side various characteristics, right, as part of their nature, which is, so there's a kind of mixture uh, of a delusion and, and desire that are working together, that are entwined together. In the, in Tsongkhapa's system, you know, which goes back to Chandrakirti, it's delusion and, and desire or delusion and hatred, delusion and anger. Um, they can be right there together. It's not like one happens and then later the other happens. They, they're, they can be intertwined. Yeah. So you may wonder, what, how did he come to have this experience? Well, he had, the, of course, he'd done a lot of various practices for many years, but the precipitator of this experience was reading um, and, and this hearing, hearing the Dharma, um, or in this case, actually reading the book. And, so then he tells us the passage from Tsongkhapa that he was reading. A coiled rope's color and form are similar to that of a snake. When you see the rope in a dim area, you might think this is a snake <clears throat> and might be afraid. When you, at that moment, when you're seeing the rope as a snake, in fact, neither the parts of the rope nor any collection of such parts is even the slightest way actually a snake. And therefore, that snake is merely constructed or set up by conceptual designation, right? Now, in that's, this case, we know that it's also completely wrong, even conventionally, right? But his point is that there isn't there anything objectively there that has the nature of a snake, right? And it's the same thing with the person. Now, of course, in a conventional sense, there is a person, but... In the, in the basis of designation of the person, then the thing that we appropriately designate as a person, there isn't any person nature in there just as much as there isn't any snake in the rope, right? Which is, a, if, you, if you think about this, it's kind of a radical thought. In, the same, in just the same way as the rope snake example, when the thought I arises in dependence on mind and body, there's nothing within the mind and body that is even in the slightest way, this I, right? So yeah, we talk about this as um, the, the basis of designation and being the mind and body and the object designated being the I, or you know, in, in the case of the table, 
table is the object designated. And then for me, I would just say it's when I see the certain shape and color, you know, and functionality or operating and I'd like designate it as a table, right? But <clears throat> I can't find um, the tableness in, in any part of the table. It's easy to break it apart in my mind and see that none of, none of or when you buy a table from Ikea or something like that, and they give you a collection of uh, table parts, right? You see that, oh, well, a collection of the parts is not actually exactly what we were hoping to have when we asked for a table. So the collection um, <clears throat> that is the stream of earlier and later moments is not the I. It's not the parts of the mind and body in any particular moment, nor is it the continuum or the stream of earlier and later moments that is the I, collection of the parts in any one moment is not the I, none of the individual parts is the I, which is like important that because some traditions will say, yeah, there is some part in there that is the I, and you just have to look carefully, right? Um, nor is the stream of any of the separate parts. You know, you can't say, um, you know, just that I, I equals the stream of my sensations or something like that. And in, in addition, there's not even the slightest something that is a different entity from the mind and body that can be taken as the I. So in other words, the I is a story that we make up, right? It's a story we tell ourselves, and that doesn't mean that it's bad, right? It doesn't mean, this is important to understand, the fact that the I, or the existence of myself as a person, is a story that I tell myself, right? It doesn't mean that that in itself is delusion. That's not delusion. That's conventional reality. That's how everything exists as, as a, um, an appropriate functional kind of narrative that we use to uh, um, get the food that we want and so forth, right? Um, the problem is not that we, we have these stories. We need to have better stories. <laughs> we need to have the best kinds of, we're not going to not have stories, we need to have the uh, appropriately, you know, useful stories. The problem is not recognizing that they are stories and thinking that our stories are the objective reality, right? And then you can see how this makes a big difference in terms of conflict with other people, right? Because you think that your story is the objective reality per se, and it's really hard to work with other people who have a different story. So this is still Tsongkhapa. He's, this, this is the passage that, you know, sent lightning through the Dalai Lama's chest. Consequently, the I is merely set up by conceptuality and dependence upon the mind and body and does not exist by way of its own nature, right? So when he read that passage, he had that triggered this profound experience. It was so uh, transformative that I, I gather, and this is just something I've heard orally, <clears throat> that he spent a lot of time consulting with other um, lamas, other, uh, you know, his tutors and um, other, you know, advanced practitioners whose opinions he valued and um, to try to work through exactly, uh, you know, exactly what this was, this transformative experience, how he could, you could categorize it or conceptualize it, but that's not so important to us is the fact that, you know, he's describing what ha this experience and, and it's coming out of an analytical, a passage that of a, of a text, which impresses him with the power of its an analytic deconstruction of our ordinary idea of who we are, right? Okay, so I guess you're up then. Um, yeah, was a teacher who was <clears throat> sent to the West, uh, taught in Switzerland for a long time to propagate the Dharma. And, uh, but before he came, when he was younger, he did a meditation retreat up above Dharamsala, India, um, in which he lived in a tiny little hut, you know, and just 
focused all his energy all the time on trying to understand this view of reality, trying to understand what it means to, for, to say that things exist, but don't exist as they appear. <clears throat> and uh, the product of that was um, a series of, a short series of poems, which is called uh, Songs of the Profound View. And also then he wrote a short uh, commentary on those poems. So that book's still around. I don't think it's actually in print, but it is available at Songs of the Profound View. This is from um, that book, a couple of the passages from it. If you don't understand how the enemy, the afflictions exists. So important point to note, the enemy is never another sentient being, right? We're dedicating ourselves to helping sentient beings, right? But there is an enemy. The enemy is these, um, you know, harm, this problematic uh, emotions that motivate harmful behavior. So how do these exist? They, they don't exist intrinsically. They're not built into the very essence of our minds. <clears throat> but if you don't understand that, you know, these things are empty, then even no matter how much you congratulate yourself <clears throat> on being a spiritual person, you're in isolation. <clears throat> if you don't make any effort at controlling this self-grasping, right, in your own mind, then no matter what kinds of dharma you're proclaiming, it's just like an echo. So yeah, he's stressing that this is the this understanding, it, we suffer easily because we don't see things as they are. It's like the key to overcoming needless suffering and beginning to alleviate it, right, is insight into the way we're, we're being deluded. Um, and another passage from that, those poems, he says, many things briefly appear in a variety of ways. They're like drawings on water. They cannot last. Being of the nature of water, they arise from water and they repeatedly arise from and dissolve back into it. I like this because, you know, I've been using like water and rivers and the flowingness of things, um, right? To try to give a, a sensory image of what it's like to see things more as they actually are. Yeah, and he's, he's using that, right? Things are the nature of water. They're the nature of there. There, there's this fundamental flowingness to things, and in our experience, like out of this flow, <laughs> there temporarily arises uh, certain things, such as a table, right? When we designate it and treat it as though it wasn't flowing, but it is flowing. It's in the nature of to flow. It's water. Right. And, it, and it, it, you know, having been drawn on the surface of the water, it dissolves back into it. I like that. And then, um, so this one's maybe a little harder. He says, when examined, it is a condition for seeing suchness. When not examined, it's a condition for seeing phenomena and their function. So, he doesn't say in this poem what it is, right? Um, but it could be anything, right? It, it is X, <laughs> could X, um, right? Whatever, whatever you look at, if you scrutinize it deeply and ask what is the fundamental nature of this, then X is functioning as a condition for seeing into the fundamental nature of things or suchness, things just as they are, right? But if you don't examine it, you do, don't you just say, well, what is, you don't scrutinize it and you don't interrogate it in the sense of asking what its fundamental nature is. And you just say, well, you know, is this, should I buy this potato or this potato? Is this, is this, uh, is this squash past its date, you know, or sh should I, uh, should I buy it or should I leave it here? Right. And there's practical decisions we have to make all the time about what words to say to each other, right? What to buy, how to speak, treat one another, and all of our possible choices of action, buying or not buying and so forth, they're all equally empty. <laughs> and just simply knowing their ultimate nature as impermanent and empty 
doesn't help us become the most skillful or effective helpers of other beings or even make us uh, effective in taking care of our own basic needs, right? Because food and non-food are equally empty. We just notice only emptiness. We wouldn't know what to eat. So when you don't do that, you don't do this inquiry or scrutiny of everything all the time. You do a deep inquiry into the nature of things. You see that they're empty and then emerge out of that analysis and say, oh yeah, this is you know, functionally useful uh, as, a, as a marker or whatever, but don't take, you no longer are fooled into things. So like when His Holiness comes out of the meditation on that Tsongkhapa passage, he, he says, oh, I see persons, but they seem like magical illusions. So yeah, these persons are there, but they're like, he doesn't say they are magical illusions. He said they're like magicians' illusions in that they have a, dis they don't exist the way they appear. It's, it's trend, it's obvious right on the surface of how they appear that that appearance is deceptive. Okay, so those were my analytical meditation examples. Um, so I just wanted to look briefly at um, the establishment of mindfulness sutta because mindfulness, of course, is such a big uh, practice in um, the West as it's been appropriated and adapted and has helped so many people in its therapeutic forms in the West. And um, it's, it's important to understand that uh, it's not necessarily exactly the same. It's not exactly the same thing as what we find in the, um, the Buddhist scriptures or what we've even found in traditional uh, Asian Theravada practice. Um, so this is what the Buddha says, a monk having gone to the wilderness to the shade of a tree in an empty building sits down, folding his legs crosswise, holding his body erect and bringing forth mindfulness. Always mindful, he breathes in, mindful, he breathes out. Breathing in long, he discerns, I'm breathing in long. Breathing out long, he discerns, I'm breathing out long. Breathing in short, he discerns, I'm breathing in short. Breathing out short, he discerns, I'm breathing out short. Yeah. When walking, he discerns, I'm walking. Or however his body is disposed, he discerns it in that way. So when eating, drinking, chewing, savoring, urinating, defecating, and eat, there's a much longer list, which I, you know, cut the lips, made an ellipsis of, he makes himself fully alert. So being fully alert and noticing each thing for what it is, each sensation, each moment of experience, you know, trying to recognize in a, with a, in a, to the smallest degree, each sensation, each thought, each moment of experience as it arises and passes away. Seeing it for what it is, right? It's a, a process of introspective discrimination, right? It's a process of introspective investigation of who, what exactly is going on here between my toes and the crown of my head. But what, it, what is here? Let's just look and see what we can notice. And then, then notice in a finer and finer and finer, you know, fine grained way. Yeah. So this is, um, this is in the, also in the scripture. It's just as if a sack were full of various kinds of grain, wheat, rice, mung beans, kidney beans, sesame seeds, husk rice, and a man with good eyesight, that represents the meditator, obviously, pours it out. And if that person were to reflect, this is wheat, this is rice, these are mung beans. That's, that's how the Buddha describes, although you know the sutta is quite a bit longer than this, but that's how he describes mindfulness. The same way monks reflect on this very body from the soles of the feet on up, and the crown of the head down, thinking, in this body, there are head hairs, there are body hairs, there are nails, there are teeth, skin, flesh, tendons, bone, bone marrow, kidneys. And actually, of course, the lips, the list of organs and uh, contents of the body uh, in the scripture is quite about a bit longer than this, right? And, and yeah, quite detailed, right? This is what's actually here. Right? 
So um, I wanted to show you that because um, our next uh, awakening experience is somebody who, in my opinion, was doing exactly this. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, first we're gonna do Vajira. So yeah, you know, we have, um, maybe you've heard if you've been around these kinds of teachings for a while, the example of thinking uh, of the chariot and saying, you know, a person is, is uh, designated to the collection of mind and body just the way a chariot is designated to a collection of chariot parts. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that example actually comes from the Pali Canon in a passage where the bhikkhuni, you know, the, the fully ordained uh, female monastic, Bajira, um, having understood the view, um, recognizes that uh, Mara has now approached her with del you know, representing delusion. And, um, and she says to Mara, why now do you assume a being? Have you grasped onto a view of things as having a stable existence, right? This is a huge heap of sheer constructions. I like that passage because a heap of sheer constructions, if you just take it on the face, it seems to imply it's not only a heap of things, each individual thing of which can be found, but it's a heap of things, each one of which is itself a construction. That's what she says. So here, no being is found when we search among these constructions we can't really pin down what this being is. And then she compares that to the chariot. A bunch of stuff is put together in a certain way. The word chariot is used just like that. When the aggregates of mind and body are present, there's the convention of being, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> then um, here's the, this is a story from the book, uh, Journey of One Buddhist Nun by Sid Brown, which is an anthropological account of her um, investigation of the condition of female monastics in Thailand, I think in the late 90s. And uh, um, especially focusing on one particular woman uh, who gave herself, she, that woman gave herself the pseudonym Wabi. Um, and yeah, there's quite a lot in that book about Wabi's experiences, which are, she, Wabi is a, a prodigy at meditation. She, she readily goes into deeply concentrated states, and then she gradually learns how to use those concentrated states to inquire or analyze, you know, what the nature of her emotions are and what the nature of her bodily experiences. <clears throat> and one of the passages Wabi is quoted as follows. After some days of meditation, I felt as though um, each, when I thought of each part of my body, that part went away. It fell on the ground as I attended to it. Each part peeled off from head to toe, the hair on my head, the hair on my body, the fingernails, the toenails, the teeth, the skin, and then it would all return. From this, I found that I had a consciousness that could understand the difference, that I had suffering in one part, but peace in another part. And my heart mind was at peace for the same, for the first time. So it's not a very detailed description, but it seems to me that what she's doing is exactly, you know, the kind of uh, piece by piece deconstruction um, of what it is that is imagined as a solid self, right? Um, taking apart her body piece by piece, even using same of the, some of the same pieces that are in the sutra, right? And then finding that that kind of the insight that comes out of that kind of deconstruction gives her a sort of peace, a, a deeper peace in her heart and mind than she's ever had before. And I think what she means is that I still could feel pain <laughs> in my body, right? But at the same time, I discovered this deeper, uh, kind of peace that I, my heart was truly at peace. And another experience she has, um, <clears throat> she's on retreat and there's a lot of other monastics there and they're all chanting together in the evening. And she says, it's a beautiful sound and it entered my heart and there were so many people around, but I felt like everything was very still and I felt free from all things. 
and I felt as though perception was extinguished completely and I could not remember where I was or who I was or what my name was. It was really empty of all things. And I continued to meditate like this until dawn and I'd been sitting very still, not moving at all for so long that the other monastics got worried about her. But I was actually very peaceful and still. And at that moment, I felt suchness. She uses that word suchness. And from that day on, I've been able to understand the meaning of suchness. So the meaning of reality, the way things actually are. She's, yeah, she's saying that, yeah, it's not that she became a perfect person, but that she came up, became a person with insight into the, uh, the nature of things as, as they are, as opposed to how delusion constantly constructs them for us, right? And um, yeah, that isn't the end of her story, nor is it the beginning. <laughs> it's kind of an experience that comes along in the middle of her story, and she has a lot of ups and downs along her spiritual path. But this is obviously a, a peak experience of awakening or insight. And then moving on to our um, East Asian folks, um, you probably know Cold Mountain or Han Shan in Chinese. Um, I think Han Shan is, um, well, I guess, I don't know for sure, but it, it, appear, it appears to me from what I've been able to read that he's the best of Chinese Buddhist poets. It's a little bit unclear exactly whether, you know, who Han Shan was, but it seems like he was a hermit, you know, and he was uh, studied both Taoism and Buddhism and withdrawn from the world to meditate and also sometimes to suffer loneliness and cold up in the mountains. And, in one of his more, what do you say? Uh, one of his more ecstatic passages, he says, my heart is like the autumn moon shining clean and clear in a green pool. No, that's not a good comparison. Tell me how shall I explain? So that's, that's a short, one of his shorter, shortest poems, all, all of them are somewhat short. And, um, the idea is of the last two lines is that you can make up, he can make up a metaphor to try to, uh, to give us a sense of what he's experiencing, but he wants us to understand that the metaphor doesn't actually capture the experience, right? Yeah. Um, so the moon is very, very often used in. In, in almost all East Asian Buddhist poetry, the moon represents uh, Buddhahood or Buddha, right? And um, Buddha, not necessarily in this, not in a, like a historical person sense, but you know, fundamental Buddhahood that's present in all of us, right? So my mind is like the autumn moon shining clear, clean and clear in the green pool. So he's not actually even looking at the moon necessarily, right? <laughs> he's looking into the water and he's seeing the image of the moon, right? So he's not taking it as a substantial thing. He's taking it as a, as a radiant, but um, illusion-like thing, like a beautiful image or reflection. So even the mind or even the Buddha, right, is not um, taken as existing in and of itself, right? But having this illusion-like character. Okay, so um, that's China. Now we'll look at um, some uh, Japanese Zen experiences. Uh, so this is from the book, uh, it's now titled, uh, My Journey in Search of the Way. Um, used to be called in an earlier edition, Passionate Journey. It's by Sally King who teaches at James Madison University in Virginia. And it's her translation and commentary on or annotation of uh, a memoir by a student of Yasutani Roshi, um, a woman, Satomi Miyoto, who, who was a peasant from Hokkaido, which if you don't know, is like the Northern Island of Japan, it is more rural and colder 
right, uh, in the north. And she, she was a peasant girl from a rural part of Hokkaido. Um, but she uh, had this, what do you say, spiritual calling, right? And she didn't know anything. She wasn't, uh, she wasn't trained in the Dharma in, in any sort of way. And in, in the beginning of her spiritual search, she went through a lot of difficulties. And she also spent a lot of time as a Shinto shaman. But ultimately, um, she learned more and more about Buddhism. She had some teachers who helped her a little bit. And then finally, she, uh, it, when she was quite old, actually, she uh, was taken in um, by Yasutani Roshi um, and uh, meditating under his instruction on the koan mu. Um, she has, you know, a Kensho or awakening experience. Um, so Mu, if you don't know, is like uh, uh, the, the punchline or the, the head word of a, of a koan that um, is commonly used in Rinzai meditation as a starting point in meditation. Um, a monk asked, Joe Shu, in all sincerity, does a dog have Buddha nature? And Joe Shu said, Moo. Okay, so um, the Roshi just tells people to meditate on that and sh show that, realize Moo, show them Moo, right? So Moo becomes the object of concentration in the sense of the, um, in the sense of the, uh, of the second training. As people focus their minds on Mu, what is this Mu? What is this Mu? And they try to penetrate into what, what, what is it that we're actually looking at when we talk about Mu, right? They, the pattern in, is that people who, who do this, this kind of uh, koan meditation with, on Mu tend to have experiences of non-duality. That is that they realize in some sense that it's, that Mu is meditating on Mu, that, that everything is non-different from Mu, that the uh, dualistic separations between uh, things um, are collapsed in the sense that everything is ultimately non-different from this Mu on which they've concentrated their mind. So yeah, and they reach that through, that as an experience, not an idea, through a lot of difficult meditation. And that's what she says, I was exhausted when I tried to settle on the pillow. I laid my head down. I saw, ah, this out breath is mu. This in breath is mu. Next breath, mu, next breath, mu, mu. A whole sequence of mu. Croak, croak, the frogs, meow, meow, the cat. These two are mu, mu. Everything's mu. Bedding, the wall, the column, the sliding door. These two are mu. This and that, everything is mu. Ha, 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 that Roshi is a rascal. He's always tricking people with this moo, moo, moo. In other words, actually, you have know, moves right in front of everybody's face all the time, right? It looks like it's something hidden, but it's actually, you know, pointing us at, at the, appear the very nature of all the appearances around us. And then um, she says, I felt as if a chronic disease of 40 years had been cured in an instant and I slept soundly that night. <clears throat> but now, later on at the very end of the book, she says, now that I've awakened from the dream, can see things clearly. I know the saying that you don't have the same experience twice is really true. Um, so, um, wh what this seems to mean, the first bullet point there in context is that Every single moment we encounter a, a different set of circumstances, right? And to be born again, to be, to, be full, to be awakened is to be fully attentive and awake in each new moment and responding to what appears in that moment, right? Um, right? And not uh, living mechanically, right? But yeah, being fully awake, you, you don't have the same experience twice. And you then can, what from that basis, try to respond appropriately to every new situation without pulling out some canned set of answers. It's also clear to me that the return of this lost child to the original home for which she has longed is a gift. 
thanks to the compassion and skill of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Since Kensho, this awakening experience, I've continued to work with these koan meditations one after another. And every time I penetrate a koan, you know, have one of these Kensho experiences, a thin skin peels off my mind. Layer by layer, the mind's foundation becomes more and more clear. Very important to notice here that like, she, she's not like she has this aha experience and realizes that everything is moot and then she's done. That's like the beginning of a deepening, deepening, continuing Zen practice, right? In which she continues to see things more and more clearly. <clears throat> um, the more I enter into the ocean of Buddha Dharma, the more I understand how deep it is. And yet its content is nothing at all. And a human life that is filled with this nothing at all is a marvelous thing, right? So she's the, saying even the Dharma itself is empty and yet it's, it's a, certainly a, a marvelous manifestation, transformative for her. And then she ends the book with this poem, awakening from the dream, I see sincerity is simply my original nature. Where then shall I look for it? So um, in the context of the book, sincerity was like a theme. It's like what her existential question was since from the beginning of the book. Uh, is there really such thing as sincerity? Which meant uh, purity of heart or honesty, uh, being true to oneself, really knowing oneself and being honest with oneself. So um, I was trying to suggest in an earlier one of these sessions of, that along with kindness as the beginning, middle, and an end of the path, that honesty, being, being real about what's actually going on here, honest with ourselves and honest with each other, is, is the, um, what do you say, ordinary language way to talk about wisdom, right? To actually be real about what's actually going on. And I think that's how that sort of, um, that's what she means by sincerity, a, pure, a kind of purity of heart where the delusions or illusions or lies, <laughs> the lies and deceptions uh, are stripped away, right? Okay, so I like that book, Satomi Miyoto. I try to teach it to the students, but um, sometimes they have a hard time with it because um, one of the reasons is that along the way, along her spiritual path, she, she has a child, she has a baby when she's really not prepared to have a baby. And then uh, she neglects the baby and uh, the, um, the baby ends up being taken away from her. But ultimately she's, uh, yeah, reunited with her children, has good relations with them and I guess Sally King got permission to translate her memoir from one of her daughters um, later on. Um, so, you know, it's very interesting to me that like people are okay with uh, Siddhartha leaving uh, his child behind, but then you have this woman who in her quest for the Dharma abandons her baby and it's like, okay, she's essentially a bad person. And you know, it's, it's essentially bad. It's a sen absolutely bad. And therefore, not, it, nothing can be positive or spiritual about this book. Yeah. So Soka Morinaga wrote a book called Novice to Master, in which he tells about desperation of his early life when he was drafted out of school and made to train as a kamikaze pilot and fortunately um, avoided um, that because of the end, the war ending, and um, then was completely impoverished. You say spiritually, uh, emotionally, and um, economically, and uh, found refuge in a Zen monastery, um, where he really didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> so that's the novice part, and then ultimately became a Roshi himself. Um, so this is a couple of passages about where he's describing his, you know, culminating insight experience. Um, so he says, he, he's talking about the koan 
uh, what was your original face before your parents were born? Which he said, it's easy for the Zen monks when the Roshi gives them that, that to understand that what is your original face before your parents are born is a way of telling them to inquire into who they are. <laughs> what is your, your well, who are you? Don't just say, you know, um, I'm from Brooklyn. Who are you really? Who are you fundamentally? Right. But when you you understand that and you give some sort of intellectual answer based on that, the teacher will you know shout at you and say, you know, insist that you demonstrate it, you perform it, you show your original face, you know, not by idea, but by direct experience. But you know, so he does met, he has you know meditates uh, intensively for a number of years. He says, I got nothing but sleep deprived, very sparse diet, you know, not adequately uh, sheltered from cold. Um, he says, I got nothing but distress and fatigue. My head and body began to lose their normal function. But in the middle of the night, when I was a lump of fatigue on a cushion, both body and consciousness in a haze, and I could not have aroused the desire for awakening if I had wanted to, Suddenly the fog cleared and a world of lucidity opened itself, clearly seeing, clearly hearing, and yet it was a world in which there was no me, right? So this experience like of, of, the, of, of disappearing, right? The sense of self, which we're, we're so accustomed to living with, just sort of uh, evaporating. It, it seems very reminiscent of Wabi's experience doing mindfulness meditation. Right, but he's he's getting there through a different kind of practice. Um, so then Sokomori Naga shares, you know, some more of the what do you say, the fallout of from this insight. From then on down to today, the, I continue to do koan meditation all the time, the living koan of, of human life that continues without limit. I think that's like what Satomi Miyoto says: you never have the same experience twice. Every moment you're experiencing a, a, a new situation to which you must respond wholeheartedly in an awakened way, not sleepwalking. This life arises as form and continues instant by instant, appearing and disappearing, like a flickering, right? But he says it's not the flickering of a solidified individual self, the sparkling or flickering you know, as we change instant by instant, it's a sparkling appearance and disappearance of a fusion of the self and its surroundings in union. And he breaks this down quite a bit, you know, and saying how in each moment, as we appear to ourselves, right, we appear to ourselves, not just based on how we appear to ourselves the instant before, but on the changing circumstances in response to the changing circumstances around us who's with us and what kinds of relationships we have with them is what he's especially interested in. And this is what it means to say that birth and death are the pulse of Buddha life or great life, dynamic, dancing, lively, right? This is what, how he understands, yeah. This is, this is the insight that he comes to, yeah. And then, um, let's see, I'm not sure where I am in terms of time. I have uh, a, couple, a few other little, I'm gonna go out of this for a second because I cannot actually see what time it is. What time is it? Somebody tell me. What time is it, Sunny? It's 8.10. We have 20 oh. more minutes. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I usually have my phone down here so I can tell the time. <clears throat> I'm doing this, but I didn't bring it. Okay, so I just, yeah, along these lines, I, I was looking around today to see if I could, you know, pull together a few other ones. In, in the old book, Three Pillars of Zen, um, there's a sort of collection of anonymous Kensho experiences that, um, in the Rinzai tradition. And one of them identified as Mr. P.K., an American businessman, is obviously uh, Philip Kaplow Roshi himself, uh, who put the book together. Um, and he, he gives quite a long account of his 
spiritual quest embedded within that book, but then sort of coming to the climactic experience. It says, meditating silently in the temple garden till the clock struck one, I rose to exercise my stiff, aching legs and staggered into a nearby fence in the dark. Suddenly I realized the fence and I are one formless wooden flesh, Mu, right? He's been meditating on Mu. And then later, you know, his teacher says, you, know, you have to go practice some more. And he does. And after more difficulties, his Roshi, you know, realizes he's on the verge of a breakthrough and starts speaking to him saying, the universe is one. <clears throat> he says, each word was tearing into my mind like a bullet. And all at once, the Roshi, the room, and every single thing disappeared in a dazzling stream of illumination. And I felt myself bathe in delicious and unspeakable delight and for a fleeting eternity, eternity, a fleeting eternity. So it's like time also disappears. I, I was alone and I alone was. So yeah, that's Kaplow's experience, description of his own Kensho experience. Um, and uh, then later in the book, he, uh, well, in the same sort of section of the book, he gives a, some other Kensho experiences from doing similar practices. Um, this one Japanese man, you know, many similar things as to the other people. As his mind was foggy, a quotation washed into my consciousness and the co quotation is from Dogen. I came to realize clearly that mind is no other than mountains, rivers, and the great wide earth and the sun and the moon and the stars. And I repeated this quotation to myself and all at once I felt as I was struck by lightning and next instant heaven and earth crumpled and disappeared. So you notice there's a lot of vanishing of, of the world in these experiences, a vanishing of self and sometimes vanishing of the whole world around it. And, and that is like, you know, what we see in descriptions of what it's like to realize emptiness. When you realize emptiness, you're not no longer realizing the emptiness of X, but only emptiness sort of, there's a kind of non-dualistic appearance arises in the mind, right? It seems like there's some kind of quality. The other kind of parallel here is that a number of these people have awakening experiences in relationship to the words, words of the Dharma that they're reading or else have heard and are repeating within their own minds, or the Roshi is saying something to them, right? Yeah. I've totally disappeared. Transcending the law of cause and effect or controlled by the law of cause and effect. In other words, the dualism of being um, in nirvana or being in cyclic existence, any kind of such dualism vanishes from my mind. And so surely the world has changed with this experience, but how can I describe the way it's changed? The ancient said the awakened mind is comparable to a fish swimming. That's how it is. No stagnation, no hindrance. Everything flows smoothly and freely. Everything goes naturally. This limitless freedom is beyond all expression. Um, yeah, and that is another similar experience from Three Pillars of Zen. Person out meditating, doing a lot of hard meditating. This says abruptly pains disappear and there's just moo. <laughs> yeah. A bell is ringing, how cool and refreshing. Everything is freshness and purity and every single object is dancing vividly and inviting me to look and every single thing occupies its natural place and breathes quietly. Okay, so um, coming to the end now with um, Thich Nhat Han. So of course he's in the um, Vietnamese Buddhist tradition. And this isn't exactly from a memoir or an autobiography. It's um, a passage where he, one of many passages where he so vividly expresses the view, um, the, 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 the kind of insight that one is seeking through this kind of inquiry um, to overcome the delusion of accepting things just the way they appear. And um, he expresses it in such a beautiful poetic way, even though it's not in the first person. Um, I, I usually, I 
usually use this in my Buddhism class as a starting point, actually in the class to get the students to see that there's something interesting about Buddhism before I start getting into anything historical. Right. There's a cloud here in this piece of paper. Without a cloud, there'll be no rain. Without rain, the trees cannot grow. Without trees, we cannot make paper. So the cloud is essential. It's indispensable for the existence of paper. If there's no cloud, and the sheet of paper can't be here either. So the cloud and the paper inter are, right? He makes that up, inter being. We look deeply, we see that in the paper, there's also the sun, because nothing can grow without sunshine, right? And the logger and the lumber mill and the wheat and the logger's parents, they're necessary, they're indispensable for the existence of the paper. And also when we look deeply, we see ourselves. When we look at the paper, I look at the paper, you look at the paper, it's our perception and your mind and my mind are meeting this paper, like sharing a, a common um, experience of designating it appropriately in that way. And we're both right there because it, was, it doesn't exist as paper except in relationship to their being, being beings for whom it's appropriate for it to be designated as paper. So he concludes that by saying, well, what's not here in the paper, right? Earth, rain, minerals, heat, the river, everything is coexisting with the piece of paper. And also for the paper to exist, it, it, it entirely depends on things that we would think of as other than paper, non-paper elements, right? Carbon is not paper. The sun is not paper. Logger's mother is not paper. But there isn't any paper except in dependence upon all these things. So to exist at all is always to interexist, right? Like the paper, we ourselves are inevitably vast. We include all that seems to us to be other than ourselves. And when we pay close attention to who we really are, there isn't anyone else. There's no one else. There isn't anyone who's left out. And if one can act from within this understanding, right? Rising from this kind of insight, right? And going out in the world to interact with other people and service being a more, a more effective helper isn't like a strained sacrifice or good deed doing. It's just a natural activity of responsiveness, right? Like a reflex, a spontaneous gesture of care. So in order to get from, oh, this is the end of me talking, in order to get from these kinds of uh, peak experiences of insight and ecstasy, right, to um, having this kind of um, spontaneous, effective um, responsiveness to the needs of, of, of living beings, you, you have to uh, go beyond just having like uh, a moment of ecstasy and you have to integrate the, the import of that, the insight, right, behind that experience into the way you live your life. And in order to do that, you have to repeat the experience over and over it. So it becomes, um, it becomes part of your mind stream, right? It becomes integrated into the way you look at things in, in the day to day, right? Um, you have this sense of intimacy with things instead of alienation and thinking self and other you experience a kind of intimacy with the world within which you don't have to think about uh, you don't have to think about how to respond to people right ideally you have a kind of intuitive awakening to the situation such as you can spontaneously respond in a helpful way um, so that seems like quite, um, that's quite an advanced attainment, I think, beyond just having these initial, although very super powerful insights. And it's clear that a lot of people have had powerful insights into, into emptiness and still been um, 
jerks in their in their real life um, or worse. Um, that is, it, it isn't automatically magically transformative having these insights. Um, and so in a way, you know, you have to, the, the eightfold path, you know, um, goes around and round, right? And if right concentration and meditation culminates in this kind of profound right understanding, right? Then that should re lead to right kinds of thoughts and intentions as we interact with other beings and, and the right kinds of actions. And in the beginning it's right kinds of speech. In the beginning with the first training, right? In ethics, we talked about making a commitment to improve our way we treat other people, practice making commitments as a form of ethics. But ethics, you know, in the sense of uh, coming to embody kindness is in my understanding also the sort of the point of this whole thing, right? And, and the culmination of it is not to just have an ecstatic insight, right? But to integrate that into the way you act in the world so that you embody that kindness. Eight minutes left. Comments or questions? I see that the chat has a lot in it, which I couldn't see, but it doesn't seem to be questions for me. Yeah, bibliographic references from um, Sunny, another announcement. Any questions or comments? Yes, yeah, question? Sunny. Yes, I'm going back to the um, first part of your teaching this afternoon tonight um, about um, the dependent arising and everything depends on on uh, mental um, which is a mental imputation yeah. so in the end so that's yeah. like mental point of view so my question is this um so how does that avoid how do how do you avoid falling into the trap of i or other people too i believe it therefore it's got to be true you know, oh, just oh. because I, is that like mental imputation? You know, I believe it. I believe that, you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Now, people have, have all kinds of false beliefs. <laughs> and I mean, you, right. So um, you can just start out with really obvious things, right? If somebody is, is drunk or has taken a lot of mescaline, right, or is um, uh, suffering, a, um, you know, hallucinations from a type, some type of mental illness, or, or isn't, even has, you know, some kind of problem with their vision temporarily, right, then they can perceive things that seem very plausible and real to them, but um, are, what do you say, discredited by the perception of people who aren't suffering from those particular situations, other human beings. So the idea is that in being embodied as a human being, we have certain kinds of senses. We don't have spider sense. <laughs> we don't have echolocation sense, right? We don't sense magnetic fields the way apparently some animals do, right? There's all kinds of senses that we don't have that we can find out that other animals have. And then we have, obviously, uh, we're equipped with a bunch of faculties that, you know, um, a configuration of faculties that sort of constitute, are, are part of our karmic inheritance of being human. So, uh, this is the way I understand Tsongkhapa's system. For us um, as humans, if we look at a, a hat and insist on that it's a cat, it doesn't obviously make it a cat. It doesn't even make it a cat for us. It isn't, it, it can't function as a cat. And um, 
Yeah, it won't eat any of the cat food we give it. And you, you just think of you know any, any kind of example like this, people uh, can have all kinds of false beliefs, even about what things are appearing to them in a sensory way. And when you think about more philosophical things, um, right? There were, right, people who until very recently um, and even now uh, take it that uh, women are somehow intrinsically inferior to men, right? Well, <laughs> well, this is uh, this is this is wrong, and but it's to the discrediting of it, the showing that it's wrong, isn't based on understanding emptiness, right? It, it's based on like more careful investigation of human experience, including the experience of women at the ordinary conventional level. Right. And so this is why it's very important in Tsongkhapa's system to say, no, you don't just dissolve everything into emptiness and then you're good. <laughs> you, you have to be able to make accurate distinctions at the conventional level. Like the Buddha was saying, this is wheat, this is barley, this is a mung bean and so forth like that. And uh, so that kind of discerning of, you know, what's, what's going to be good to eat and what's not, what's going to be good to take into your what's going to be helpful to take into your mind and what, what's not is, is really crucial. And um, yeah, making these kinds of discriminations at the, at the conventional level is indispensable. So people can have, uh, people can have wrong beliefs and they do have a lot of wrong beliefs. Um, and um, so the, the, that's, I don't think that's really in question. Um, the problem is um, because you're not going to say that relativism means that every single person can have their own private universe. Um, we share so much in common as humans because of the way our minds and bodies are, right? And it's so different from sharks and bats and mosquitoes, right? And and that's what that those those shared commonalities. I guess we could call them biological. Or, or karmic, depending, you know, is bio karma, bio, bio karmic, those bio karmic similarities, those kinds of embodiments, you know, constitute the proper frame of reference for the world. And by proper, I mean the frame of reference that will lead to most effective action over the longer term, right? So people might have, um, yeah, people might have thought that. Um, women were incapable of being presidents or prime ministers until recently, but most people I don't think think that anymore. And so that was a wrong belief. It wasn't like it was a right belief then and became a wrong belief now. It was a wrong belief then, right? And it wasn't found out to be wrong through realizing emptiness. It was found out through deeper and you know lived experience at the conventional level. Yeah. So then the problem becomes, and maybe this is where you're going, is like, if, if you believe someone else has a wrong belief, say a sexist belief or a racist belief, you know, what are you supposed to do? Well, that's a different, that's a different question, right? How do you change somebody else's mind? There's um, a lot of re research on that right now, right? How to good. talk. That to was people. the question. Actually. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah, it's yeah, a but... yeah. I don't know. I've been reading about it because of, um, Mm, yeah, all these kinds of dialogues that are going around about white supremacy culture and so forth. And um, it seems that, uh, it seems so far, so the research that I've read so far is just presenting people with a set of facts that contradicts their belief is surprisingly ineffective. <laughs> It's like, and even there's some of the research, recent research suggests that it can be counterproductive, which is like, really like, okay, what are we going to do then? You know, <laughs> so one of the things that has had some success was uh, telling stories. So if you're meeting with the, uh, the KKKs, women's auxiliary well this is actually a real story meeting with the women who are married to the guys in the white sheets and you know you get together with them you don't obviously start telling them 
how stupid their racist attitudes are because <laughs> that's not going to be very effective. So what, what's helpful is asking them to tell their stories, tell the stories of their lives and, and you know, how they came to be in the situation that they're in to be affiliated with a, a validly racist organization and how, how they've gotten into that situation, what are, how they came to the attitudes about race that they have. And then you have to listen to those people and not interrupt them and you have to make them feel that they're being heard, which could be tricky, but that's, that's the crucial thing because the research I read anyway suggests that if people really feel that they're listened to when they tell a story, not when they rant about their beliefs, but when they tell their personal story about how they came to those beliefs, if they really feel they're being listened to. So this isn't going to work so well on Facebook. If they feel they're being listened to person face to face, then it creates a receptiveness, not 100% of the time, but it, it maximizes their receptiveness to hearing your story. So you have to be ready to tell your story, right? And not just like a set of arguments, right? But you have to tell a personal story about how you came to your anti-racist perspective, right? Right. And if you tell your personal story, they're much more likely to listen to it because they've just experienced being heard by you. Anyway, that's what I've read as being more effective than trotting out the data. Thanks everybody. Um, I think uh, maybe you know, but if you don't, um, I guess I'm holding my first Shanti Deva Dharma office hour on Wednesday evening, the day after tomorrow. So if you're interested in talking to me about anything privately, um, yeah, you can sign up for that. I don't know how because I'm not there, but I'm sure that Snay here or Sunny or Sheila can uh, help you with that. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you all for your attention and giving me this opportunity to, uh, to hear myself <laughs> talking through these important ideas, right? I, I think listening to the Dharma uh, includes teaching the Dharma because you hear it when you're Actually, you hear it really well when you're the one who has to talk. Um, did I share my screen? We're just gonna do, we'll do a dedication of merit. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain to the state of a guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. Okay, thank you everybody. You can. Um, you can email me if you want or come to my Dharma office hours. Bring up me.